do something cool. So today, what I want to show you is um, a really cool machine learning application. And the thing about machine learning is, if you look at um, the field of machine learning right now, it's all Python. Machine learning, it's, it's all Python. Python or R, you know, or um, sometimes you see other weird programming language like Braintree. Um, but most of it, like 99% is Python. Python has become the standard uh, programming language for machine learning. And that's fine. That's all good. But unfortunately, Python is a language optimized for rapid prototyping. Um, it's not specifically designed for um, high performance or for enterprise software environments. Uh, Python is fantastic to very quickly hack on, with data and um, research uh, data science algorithms and quickly assemble neural networks and try a few, try a hypothesis, you know. So it, it's great for research. But it's not very good if you want to build commercial applications with it. So what I try to do in all my trainings and my webinars and everything is um, I try to replicate the same stuff in C Sharp. So I build C Sharp applications that do cool stuff with neural networks, and with machine learning and deep learning. Um, it's pretty hard, actually, because there's not, not a lot of code um, and not a lot of C Sharp code out there um that can work with machine learning and deep learning but you can get quite far so today i'll show you something really cool i am going to show you um a generic object detector so an object detector is an app software app and we train it on anything we like um animals people cars objects houses uh, you name it it doesn't matter we can train the object detector on basically any kind of image and we we'll teach it to recognize certain things in an image. And then once we have a fully trained object detector, we can basically just point it at any image or you know, connect a camera and point the camera at anything. And then the software will detect objects. So it could detect traffic signs in a self-driving car. It could detect specific people. It could film people and say, that's Niels. That's Mark, you know? So you could build a like, facial recognition with it. Um, so today I'm gonna to show you something, uh, it's relatively simple. I'll show you how to train an object detector on um, cats and dogs. So I've got this data set with uh, 2000 images of cats and dogs. We'll train the neural network on, we'll train a neural network on pictures of cats and dogs. And then the fully trained neural network will use it and we'll just load random pictures of cats and dogs and see how well this neural network performs. The cool thing about this app is it's all C-sharp. So I'm, I'm not gonna show you any Python. There won't be any Python in this, uh, in this webinar. Everything is C-sharp. And I will use a Microsoft neural network library. So I'm not gonna use like TensorFlow and then you know, um, uh, fold a C-sharp wrapper around TensorFlow and then you know, do everything with TensorFlow. I mean, TensorFlow is pretty awesome. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, library, but it's, it's slow. It's actually quite slow. Uh, Google, for whatever reason, I, uh, decided not to optimize TensorFlow for speed. It's kind of weird, but well, that's what, it, that's what they did. So Microsoft has their own uh, machine learning library called CNTK, the Cognitive Toolkit. So it's often abbreviated to CNTK. It, it can do pretty much anything that, that TensorFlow can do. It's, uh, they're, they're pretty much equal in terms of functionality. But the cool thing about CNTK is it's, it's much faster than TensorFlow, like really much faster. Um, so um, I'm gonna show you an object detector built entirely with CNTK. Now, CNTK isn't C-sharp code, it's C++, but so um, the, the, the heavy lifting, the mathematics will be done by C++ code, but it is a Microsoft library. And then I'll stack C-sharp code on top of that to create and train the network, load the images and do cool stuff with it. But there won't be any Python. Um, so it's gonna be awesome. I think you're gonna like it. Um, so quickly checking the chat right now. So Hector Sosa, you are saying, um, I've started to translate my business partner's Python code to C-sharp, much faster. Yes, so Python is actually interpreted code. Um, I mean, there are Python compilers, but uh, the vanilla Python, the standard Python, is an interpreter. Um, and if you compare that to C-sharp, C-sharp is a compiled language. I mean, it compiles to bytecode, you know, intermediate language, but then there's a second compiler that compiles the intermediate language to machine language. 
So in the end, you end up with high performance assembly code, you know, running your application, running your software. So C sharp is like bloody fast. It's it's really really fast. It's it's uh, on par with hand optimized assembly language. Uh, so that, that's pretty awesome actually. Um, so C sharp in terms of performance literally blows Python out of the water. There's just no competition. In my own benchmarking, I've seen that um, C sharp machine learning code is about two and a half times faster than Python with TensorFlow. I, that, that's pretty huge. So um, yeah, I mean there's a huge advantage using C sharp in the field of machine learning and deep learning. Um, <laughs> so Hector in the chat is saying MS-DOS basic A for the win. Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna show this in basic, I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it. Um, all right, so seeing some good feedback in the chat right now. Eugene, you're saying this will be nice to learn since I'm reprogramming my Cosmo. It keeps calling my roommate monkey. <laughs> okay, you have to tell me what a Cosmo is. Um, and Alex, you're saying it's my dream, real-time recording for video image and voice translation into text, self-learning AI. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Okay, so let, let's get started. Let's take a look at the good parts. Um, let me quickly switch to the PowerPoint. So I'll start with a bunch of slides to just introduce what, what I'm going to show you. And then about halfway through the webinar, I'll switch over to, um, to my window session. So I've got Visual Studio loaded up with my code. And I've got two apps, one to train the neural network and one to run the fully trained neural network. So I'll, I'll show you both parts. So it's pretty cool. Um, stick around till the end of the webinar because I'm going to give you a free gift at the end. And it's a cool gift. It's worth about $100. So I think you're going to like it. So, um, you know, don't zone off halfway through the webinar, but stick around until the end to collect your gift. Okay, let's get started. So we're going to build a cat and dog detector in C Sharp. Um, give you, I'll give you a quick intro of who I am. So a couple of guys, a couple of you guys know me already. But if you're seeing this webinar with me for the very first time, so hi, nice to meet you. I'm Mark Farager, um, and uh, I'm a machine learning trainer right now. So my, my core business, I've got my own company, and my core business is I sell a machine learning training for uh, C-sharp developers. So it's, it's a cool training. In six weeks, I can get you fully up to speed in machine learning in C-sharp. So that's quite an interesting niche market right now, but I'll, I'll tell you more about that uh, later. Um, so I had a weird career. Um, I've been in IT for more than 20 years, and I've built some really cool stuff. Um, I built a video phone with eye contact in 2001. So this was a, a video phone where um, we had the setup where we put the camera behind the display, and you could look, uh, you could call someone up, and you could make a video call, and then you could look that person straight in the eye, and we would be able, we translated that eye contact to the other side of the call. So the other party would see a picture of you also looking straight into their eyes. So you had eye contact in, um, eye contact basically in a video call. If you look at modern laptops, I mean, like my MacBook Pro right now, I've got this display in front of me and I've got the camera at the top. So when I'm looking at the display, I'm not looking in the camera, you know, like this is in the camera and this is at the display. See, there's a small change in where I look. And it completely breaks nonverbal communication. Um, so there's no real eye contact, basically. Um, and um, the, the video phone that we built in 2001, yeah, like a long time ago, fixed that problem. So you actually had eye contact. You could look people in the eye. You had nonverbal communication over the video link. Um, so that was really uh, spectacular. And um, I, I programmed the entire thing in .NET. So I used the .NET Compact Framework back then. So it was, I think, one of the, ver the first instances of a video phone that ran .NET code. Um, 2004, a couple of years later, I built YouTube. So my business partner and I, we, we had a working YouTube prototype and we tried to sell it to mobile phone companies. And we spent about a year going from company to company and nobody wanted to touch it. So imagine a fully functional YouTube prototype. So you, you could make a movie with your, with your smartphone and then upload it and then all your friends could see it and you could share and we had all of that working. And uh, nobody wanted, to, nobody believed that, that it would be popular. So Vodafone, Orange, O2, uh, all these big phone companies said, this is never gonna work, you know? This will never be successful. So in the end we gave up. 
And then one year later, in 2005, um, YouTube uh, came on the scene, the real YouTube. And another year later, in 2006, Google bought YouTube for like, I forgot the amount, but it was like millions and millions and millions of dollars. So um, I like to believe that in another parallel universe, um, Google actually bought my software and not the other YouTube, and I would be the billionaire right now. But unfortunately, in this universe, I didn't make it. But I had YouTube before YouTube. Um, so I founded two startups. So my current startup is number three. Uh, so I had two companies in, in, uh, in the Netherlands. And this picture, that's me. So I, I used to fly a paraglider. Um, I stopped because it's a bit too dangerous. Um, but I used to fly a paraglider. So this is in Switzerland, going down um, a mountain. And my brother was flying next to me. So my brother, uh, we were flying next to each other. And my brother had a little camera and he was taking a picture like that. So that's me in the picture. So uh, I used to be a paraglider, paragliding pilot, I would say. Uh, so that is a short introduction of who I am. Okay, so um, why am I in machine learning? Why did I decide to go into machine learning? Because I believe that automation is really going to mess up the job market. Uh, there's, there's a lot of reports out there and some people say it's going to be okay and other people say we're all screwed, you know, and, and it's not entirely clear what's going to happen. But looking at neural networks, I mean, I've, I have about two years now of hands-on experience building neural networks. Looking at what they can do, um, it's, it's pretty scary. I mean, neural networks are really, really good at stuff that computers used to be really bad at, like... Um, parsing real-time video, um, parsing images, and identifying objects and images, um, listening to spoken text, and uh, understanding what is being said, uh, real-time translation into any language you like. Um, so all these features of these capabilities uh, have come on the market in the last four or five years. Um, so software is now able to autonomously perform tasks that it hasn't been able to do in all the decades before. And there, I believe there are a ton of jobs that are, uh, that are bound to be automated away, basically. So here are a couple of reports that I collected. So the one at the top is, you can see a bunch of uh, domains, a bunch of job domains, and you can see these horizontal bars. So the, the black area is the area that can be automated away. So the white area is what's left for people to do. So you can see if you're a retail salesperson, if you work at a checkout counter, you've got a huge problem because self-checkout terminals are everywhere nowadays. So that job is disappearing. So if you're in fast food, if you're in uh, McDonald's taking orders, I mean, I've, I've, I'm sure you've seen these, these, these uh, displays, huh? these huge displays that they have now in McDonald's where you can basically do the, you, you can type the order yourself. So that, that whole checkout role is disappearing. So a lot of jobs are safe from automation, like anything in healthcare, you know, like interacting with patients. Uh, teaching, what I'm doing right now, teaching is also safe from automation for now, because software is, is terrible teachers for now. And anything that has to do with managing people, so leading people, leading teams, managing people, collaborating with teams, all that kind of stuff, you're safe from automation. But any kind of work that's kind of mechanical and easy to quantify in rules um, is going to disappear. And it's going to disappear really, really quick. Um, big example, of course, is cars. Um, Tesla is pretty far along with a self-driving car. I mean, the current car, um, the latest version of their, the, their car has level three autonomy and you need up to level five to have true autonomy. But Tesla has this prototype that has level five autonomy. So they, they actually have software in alpha or beta version right now um, that where the car is completely self-driving door to door. Um, so it's just a matter of years before that software enters the market. And once cars are self-driving, I mean, uh, taxi drivers are gone, you know, bus drivers are gone. Um, all the industry that supports drivers will completely change, like garages, um, roadside restaurants. They all have to reconfigure, you know, for the new reality. So it's going to have quite an impact on the job market. So bottom left, you can see a report by PwC. And they estimated that in 10 years' time in the United States, so in 2030, 38% uh, of all jobs would be fully automated. So like from the job market, 38% is gone. And in only 10 years' time, eh? 2030. 
Um, and there's another report by, um, so it's a different consultant company, uh, Frey and Osborne, and they peg the number at 47%. So if, if they're correct, then in 10 years time in the US, 47% of all jobs gone. And um, automation creates jobs as well. So it's really cool. So uh, jobs are disappearing and jobs are reappearing. So it's, it's like a net effect. But the really uh, nasty thing here is that the jobs that disappear are the automatable jobs. So the mechanical jobs where you don't have to think. And the jobs that are reappearing are the smart jobs where you have to be smart and creative and good with people and you, have, you need to have management skills. So basically we have this job market here with the, you know, the high end jobs here and the low end jobs there. And automation is removing this bit really, really quickly and reintroducing jobs up here. So we're going to have a huge problem with training people. We need to train people with a rigid, uncreative mindset to become flexible and creative. Otherwise, they won't have work. So I think in the future, a lot of people will be unemployable. Um, so a very good strategy to uh, protect yourself from that is to learn machine learning. So you need to learn to program the robots, so to speak. A robot can never steal your job if you were the person writing the robot software or, you know, maintaining the robots. So it's, it's a good long-term strategy to make sure that you survive the wave of automation. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, things look terrible, you know, like, oh my God, the robots are coming, you know, help, what are we going to do? Um, but learn how to build the robots and that will save your career. So if you're a software developer, uh, machine learning is pretty awesome right now. It's, the field is wide open, salaries are super high, and there's very little competition. Um, so if you get a job in machine learning, your position is safe. You won't be fired, you won't be outsourced, your job won't be offshored, you won't get a pay cut. You've got job security. And job security is a pretty valuable thing right now, you know, with globalization going on and we're all competing in the IT markets. I mean, if I start developing, I'm competing with people in Vietnam and China and the Philippines, you know, the world has become tiny, basically. We're all competing with each other. So if you want to survive on the software development market, then you really need these, these skills that are safe from automation. So learn how to build robots and work on your people skills, you know, learn how to collaborate, how to lead a team, how to manage people, uh, brush up your interpersonal skills. Those two things will save you. So in this webinar, let's focus on the robot building, building a robot. So if you want to get up to speed in machine learning, uh, it's not that complicated, actually. Uh, there's a bunch of learning strategies for uh, software nowadays. So we, we all group this stuff under the term machine learning, but it's a number of um, uh, specific algorithms, and you can easily learn all of them. So this is like a, a quick uh, overview of the most important stuff that you need to learn. So you can see you've, we've got supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So like supervised learning is we, we train software on data and we tell the software what the answers are up front. So like I hold up a picture of a cat, you know, and I, I train my software like this is a cat. And I also hold up a label that says cat, you know. So I tell the software, learn this. This picture goes with this label. And then I hold up a picture of a dog and I hold up another label that says dog. And again, I tell the software, okay, now learn these two. This picture is that animal. So that's supervised learning. We have the data and we have the answers. But there's also a field of unsupervised learning, which is pretty cool. There we just, we, we feed the data into the computer and we say, you know, I've got a bunch of animals in these pictures and um, can you sort them for me? Like um, cluster, group all the, all the animals that are the same, group them all together. So the, the software would start looking at the animal pictures and doing analysis on it. And then eventually it would split out all the dogs and all the cats. It would separate them and it would say, okay, so I've got a pile of animals here, a pile of animal pictures. I've got a pile of animal pictures here. And I'm pretty confident that they're different animals, that this is one type of animal and this is another type of animal. And then after the training is complete, we tell the software, awesome work, computer. That left pile, we call those dogs, and that right pile, we call those cats. You know, and then the software can say, okay, all right, I'll label them from now. But the software does its own clustering. So unsupervised learning is pretty cool. It's um, um, like Google, uh, Google's deep mind algorithms, you know, where you know, this computer plays StarCraft against itself. You know, that, that's an example of unsupervised learning. So basically a computer starts doing completely random stuff in a game and then it keeps playing over and over and over again until it gets the highest score. 
and there's absolutely no information going in up front. So nobody is teaching the computer, this is how you play StarCraft. This is the, the, a good strategy to win the game. It's just, you know, it's like we tell the computer, you know, just figure it out. Start with random stuff and just, you know, keep tweaking your strategy internally until you get a decent score. So that's unsupervised learning. Um, now, a very important one, the one that I work with almost daily, is neural networks and deep learning. So neural networks and deep learning, it's, um, you can do supervised and unsupervised uh, learning with, uh, with neural networks. Wait, give me a sec. I need to mute someone because I can hear audio. Uh, one of you guys has got your microphone open. Here you go, Guillermo. I'm going to mute you quickly. There we go, that's better. Um, okay, so neural networks, you can do supervised and unsupervised learning with neural networks. Um, the neural networks are, they were invented in 1970 and they mimic our brain. So basically this is stuff that came straight from biology. Eh? People, uh, biologists um, um, took apart brains, basically. They looked in brains of animals, they looked in brains of people, and you know, they, they basically started to reverse engineer our brain and see how they worked. So that's how we discovered that our brains are made up of neurons and they're all interconnected with connections. And that basically up here, we have this huge big soup of uh, millions of neurons with literally billions of interconnections. So um, machine learning is literally, we're trying to rebuild the structure of our own brains in a computer by creating this, these architectures of neurons and interconnections. And we found out, we discovered that uh, neural networks are really, really good at stuff that we humans uh, excel in and computers really struggled with in the past. Um, like uh, detecting objects, you know, like I, I do this, I hold this up and all of you guys are like, oh, this is a mobile phone. See, it's a mobile phone. But teaching a computer that this thing right here is a mobile phone and that this is my head, they really struggle with that to tell those two things apart. Um, and neural networks are pretty awesome at learning how to recognize objects and images and video. Um, also speech recognition. Um, somebody's talking into a microphone and the computer translates the audio into text and then tries to understand what is being said. I mean, if you're wondering why is um, Alexa so good, why is Siri so good nowadays, why is Google Now so good nowadays, it's neural networks. Google is running a gigantic neural network to process um, spoken speech. So if you have Google now on your phone and you're dictating into your phone, this huge neural network in the cloud run by Google is translating your speech into uh, text and then processing the text. And you can only do that with neural networks. So um, these algorithms, neural networks, they literally blow everything else out of the water in terms of capabilities and accuracy. So this was like a huge invention um, for the last 10 years, roughly 10 years, We've been able to build fairly large neural networks in software and um, use them to do really uh, cool stuff. So in this um, webinar, I'm going to show you a special, special type of neural network called a convolutional neural network. And it's a, a very specific neural network architecture that's optimized for object detection in images. So, and when working with neural networks, I like to use something called the sandwich model. Um, where I, I, I tend to skip the mathematics. A lot of courses about uh, machine learning and deep learning focus on the mathematics behind neural networks. And you can do that. And if you have a math background, it's pretty cool to start with mathematics and then work your way up to code. But it really sucks if you have a coding background and your math foundation is not that strong. Uh, because uh, neural networks use tensor algebra. Um, that can get a bit complicated and the, the math notation can get a bit cryptic. So I like to use the sandwich model where I, I, I look at the neural network and I define it in terms of layers. So basically a neural network is just a layer of neurons and we stack those layers on top of each other. And the behavior of the neural network is entirely defined by which layers I put and in which order I stack them. So that's very, the, very like a sandwich, yeah? very much like a sandwich. If I create a sandwich, um, the flavor of the sandwich all depends on what I put on the sandwich and in what order. So if I put like cheese and then bacon and then tomatoes and then some salads, you know, and then a sauce, sauce at the top, that defines the flavor of the sandwich. So I always say, if you can make a sandwich, you can work with neural networks. Because um, if you can build a sandwich layer by layer, 
then you can also create a neural network layer by layer. And it's the type of layer and the stacking of the layer that determines what the neural networks do. So um, I'm going to make you a sandwich in this webinar. And here is the sandwich that we're going to use. So this is a specific neural network architecture. So every slab that you see in this picture is a, um, a collection of neurons, a collection of neurons. Um, and for, if you go from one slab to the next, from one layer to the next, um, all the neurons in one layer are connected to all the other neurons in the next layer. So they're all connected here. I haven't drawn the connections because it would, it would create a complete mess out of this picture. So usually when we describe neural networks, we don't draw the connections. But um, in reality, every neuron in each layer is connected to every neuron in the next layer. So there are a lot of interconnecting lines going between these layers. Um, I'm going to use a layer, a neural network layer called convolution. So I won't explain what convolution is because that's actually quite complicated. So if you want to learn about convolution, you have to do a machine learning course like mine, and I'll tell you exactly how it works. But for now, so just keep in mind that convolution is a very specific mathematical operation, a mathematical algorithm that runs inside that layer. And it's really good at recognizing features in images. And a feature can be anything. Like if we try to detect a cat, a feature could be like the ears, you know, the triangular ears that a cat has. So a, a specific layer in, in this neural network could recognize cat ears. And another layer could, uh, we could train it to recognize the nose of a dog, you know, like the tip of the nose of a dog. So um, if I show a picture of a dog to that neural network, that specific layer would activate because it would recognize the nose of a dog. So basically every convolution layer in this, uh, in this picture um, responds to certain features in an image. Um, and a feature can be, as in, it can be a color, it can be a specific pattern, it can be a contour line, or it can be a highly complex thing like the eye of a, of a person or the ear of someone, you know? So um, uh, convolution layers respond to certain elements of a picture. Um, so you can see I've got these green layers, those are convolution layers. I've also got pooling layers. So the pooling layers, we put them in to stabilize the neural network. If we take them out, then um, the neural network, uh, it doesn't train very well. It, it tends to destabilize and, and crash. It, it hangs basically during training. So the, the pooling layers stabilize the training of the neural network. Um, in the end, you can see there's a red layer called dropout. Uh, dropout has the same effect. Dropout helps in training the neural network. And at the very end, we have a, a dense layer. We've got this blue layer called dense. So a dense neural network layer, we use that at the very end of a neural network to make a decision. So if we're trying to build an object detector that needs to decide if there is a dog or a cat in an image, then we always have a dense layer at the end that is basically the part of the neural network that makes the decision. So it, it, it decides if there's a dog or a cat in the image. And the final dense layer, so usually there are like two or three dense layers, and the final one has one output for every type of conclusion that we want to uh, make. So if we build a detector that recognizes cats or dogs, there would be two outputs. So one output for dog and one output for cat. So that's the final dense layer that makes that final decision. And the, um, the output will be a number between zero and one, and it's the probability that the neural network is seeing a dog or a cat. So literally at the output side of the neural network, you get two numbers. And say the one number is 0 0.9 and the other one is 0 0.1. That means that the neural network is 90% confident there's a cat and 10% confident there's a dog in a picture. So that's the output side. On the input side, we present the full image. So the input side is usually a neural network layer with one neuron per pixel. And basically we take an image and we, we, we serve, we offer up every pixel to the individual neurons. So every neuron gets one pixel. And the value that we pass into the neural network is again a number between zero and one. So often we, we convert images to black and white. And then so we have black and white pixels where we could say zero is black and one is white. And then we just literally paste that value into the neural network. And then every neuron will pass its value on to all the neurons in the next layer. And those neurons will pass their value to the next layer and so on and so on. So the data kind of cascades through the neural network layer by layer until we reach the end. 
And at the output side, we just have these two values. It's a dog or it's a cat. So that's how a neural network works. So it's just layers and layers and layers of neurons and data flows through from left to right. And the layers tend to get smaller. So uh, we start out with an image, which is very large here, like uh, 200 by 200 pixels. So we have this grid of numbers that start out. And then every layer kind of shrinks the data a bit more. So we get smaller and smaller and smaller. And at the output side, we just have two neurons left, one for its dog and one for its cat. So that's very, in a nutshell, that is the architecture of an object detector. So th it's just a specific type of a neural network. Um, okay, so I'm looking at a question from Eugene. Uh, Mark, can we use the algorithm from our previous webinar where we used eye dimension and properties to determine if a subject is a dog or not? Okay, so that was um, last week I did a webinar, no, it was two weeks ago, I did a webinar on uh, face detection, on uh, detecting um, faces and detecting features in faces, like your eye, your nose, your mouth. Uh, so basically what you're asking is, can we detect the eyes of a dog and then by the spacing of the uh, landmark points around the eye can we detect if it's a dog or a human or a, you know a human being you probably could i mean you're working on the assumption that eyes have uh, dogs have eyes that are shaped differently than human eyes so you're only looking at the shape so if that's correct then it's definitely going to work yeah but uh, if dog eyes have the same shape as human eyes then it's not going to work and keep in mind, you only have six landmark points uh, around an eye. So it's a very coarse way of detecting the shape of an eye. If you use this thing, the convolutional neural network, it will actually look at the entire eye. So it won't just look at the contour around an eye. It will also look at the, the color, the color of the iris. Um, it will look at the color of uh, eyebrows, you know, and it will use all that information to uh, make a conclusion. And that'll be a lot more accurate. I mean, think about cat eyes yeah, with their vertical pupils. I mean, it's, it's very easy for a conv convolutional neural network to pick that up. It looks at a cat, it sees the vertical slit pupils, and it's like, this cannot be a dog. And you cannot do that with the uh, trick I showed you two weeks ago. So uh, I think my gut feeling is it's probably not gonna work. Um, Okay, so uh, Redmi, you're asking a question, what's the time frame of this tutorial? Um, so I said one hour, and um, so we're 40 minutes in now. So I'll show you the code in the next 20 minutes. Um, uh, Nishar Araf on the Facebook Live, you're asking, sorry for being late, will I get a link to watch it later? Yep, I'll show you a recording. But there's a bonus in this live webinar, which will not be in the recording. So stick around to get the bonus. Um, Vasil, you're asking, can you send some documents to read after the training? Uh, no, I won't do that because what I'm showing you here is an assignment from my machine learning course. So all this stuff is in my machine learning course. So if you want to go, go further with this code, if you want to experiment on your own with this stuff, then you're going to have to enroll in my course. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so I'm going to build this in um, C Sharp. So here's the data set. I've got a data set with 2,000 pictures of dogs and cats, and um, the images are just numbered. You know? So it's just a number between zero and uh, 1,999. And it, it's just you know, pictures of dogs and cats in all kinds of scenarios. So you can see this data set has not been cleaned at all. It's uh, cats are looking uh, straight at the camera, away from the camera. Cats are far away, they're close. Uh, sometimes there's a person in the image, like look at image six sixth of jpeg you see there's a little girl in the in the picture as well um so it, it's it's a huge mesh mess it's uncleaned data <laughs> so um i've got a folder with all these images um and i'm just going to run a, a neural network and train it on all this stuff so we're going to do supervised learning which means that i will show the neural network the answers as it is learning the images so the the uh, um, answer data it looks like this so I've got this text file, uh, super simple. Eh? It's just the path to the image. And then it has um, a number, we call that the label, which indicates um, if the image is a cat or a dog. So dogs get a one and cats get a zero. And I'm showing this to the neural network. And um, I want to see the same information on the output side of the neural network. So there's gonna be one neuron 
trained by this file, which will try to replicate this answer. So basically, I'll show a picture of a dog to the neural network, say the first one, dog 17, and the label is one. So the neural network um, is going to process the pixels of the dog image, and you know the, the data will flow through the neural network, and then on the output side, there will be an answer. And the, initially, it's going to be some random number, say 0 0.3. So the neural network has the one, which the answer is supposed to be, and the answer of the neural network, which is 0 0.3, and they don't match. So it's going to have to make adjustments internally to try and get closer to one. So during training, the neural network starts adjusting the parameters, its internal parameters, to try and change that answer of 0 0.3 and get it higher. So it's, it's, it'll start out with just random changes, and it will look at what happens with the output. And if the output goes down, it will undo the changes. And if the output goes up, it will keep those changes and build on them. And it will keep changing and modifying and tweaking its internal parameters until it gets as close to one as possible. So that's basically the training process. It's constantly looking at all these images and it's constantly tweaking and adjusting to get as close to this one and this zero for every image. So supervised learning. I show the images to the neural network and I show the answers up front. All right, so let's um, show you some code. So I quickly need to change the sharing. So I'm gonna change the sharing to full screen and now move to code. Okay, so let me know if you can see the um, code in, um, on the webinar. Can you see the code right now? So I'll have to switch back to my desktop to see the answer. Yes, Eugene says, yes, I can see it. Awesome, okay, so back to the code. Okay, so I'm gonna show you two applications. <clears throat> um, hey, before I do that, put in the chat how excited you are about this stuff. Is this cool or not? Have you seen this before? Have you seen object detection using C Sharp and the cognitive toolkit, CMTK, before? And are you excited about a cat and dog detector? Are you excited about, I don't know, like creating a mobile application, you put it on your phone, your cat walks into the room, you snap a picture of your cat and your app says, yes, that was indeed a cat. I mean, it's good to be sure, right? Maybe you think you own a cat, but it's really a dog. So have the computer verify that for you. Is this cool or not? Okay, so Eugene, you're saying it's crazy cool. Uh, Brett says, let's rock. Redney says, yes, it's cool. Agni says, it's great. David is just smiling happily. Uh, Rema, super excited. Love to see C-sharp examples. Philippe, amazing stuff, awesome, thank you. Luisa, yes, very nice. Okay, cool, let's get started. So here's the code again. Um, so I'll start with the training program. So I've got this thing here, lesson two, and that is the code that will train the neural network. It's a console application, it's super simple. Um, and um, so it's basically, I just run this app on the console and it's just gonna train a neural network over and over. So let me quickly walk you through the code. So this method right here creates the training files. So I'll just skip over that. You've seen the output, it's those text files with the uh, paths to the images and the um, labels, if it's a dog or a cat. Um, then here I'm reading in the uh, cat and dog images. It's a zip file and unzipping them. So I'll skip over that as well. So let's assume I already have the images in my folder. And then here we start. Um, so the first thing I do is I create um, two image readers. So these are, um, they're, they're kind of like enumerations. They are um, uh, data readers. I can point them to an image directory and they will return a stream of images. So I can use these during training to train the neural network on images. I can, I can connect this, this image reader to the neural network and say, start sucking up new images, you know, and uh, train yourself on the data that's flowing in. And you can see I've got two readers because during training, we always do two steps. We train the neural network on a subset of the data. We call this subset a batch. So we train the neural network on a batch, and then we test the neural network on a different batch. And we do this continuously. So it's always train on like, um, like, like, like we train on 32 images and then immediately afterwards we test on 32 images. And then we train, we test, we train, we test, we train and test over and over. I'll tell you why we do it like that later. You'll see why. We have a good reason for this. 
Um, so the training part is called training, do, obviously. And the testing part, we call that validation. So we're validating the network over and over and over. So uh, I set up these two image readers to uh, provide the images during training and during testing. Um, and then the, the first thing I need to do is I need to set up the inputs and the outputs of the neural network. And this is not the actual data. This is a description of what the data will look like. So in this case, the input is a picture, right? A picture of a dog and a cat. Um, so the, my pictures, I'm, I'm scaling them down um, because um, I need neurons for every pixel of the image. So if I work with really huge pictures, I need lots and lots of neurons in my neural network. And the bigger the neural network, the slower it gets. I'm using a, a MacBook Pro from 2015. It's not that fast. So I'm, I'm, I'm scaling my images down to 150 by 150 pixels. So you can see here, my image width is 150 pixels. I've got image height of um, 150 pixels. And I've got three channels because these are color images. So I have the red, the green, and the blue color information. So it's three bytes. So uh, one image is 150 times 150 times three bytes. So I'm just telling uh, my neural network that this is the shape of the data, the shape of the input data. So, um, so I, okay, I have to point that to the correct line of code. So the width is 150, um, sorry, the width is 150 pixels, height is 150 pixels. Well, we have three channels and the data is a floating point number. So with neural networks, we always, always, always work with floating point numbers and they're always between zero and one. So uh, the output is a probability between zero and one, and the input is a pixel value between zero and one. The output is um, just two bytes. Um, they're both floats, so they're both floating point numbers. And these are just the probabilities that the image is a dog or the image is a cat. So I've got these two values and together they will sum up to one, to 100%. So um, the one value could be 0 0.9 and the other value would be 0 0.1 and together they are one. And that would say 90% chance it's a dog, 10% chance it's a cat. So that's the output side of the neural network. And then we build the neural network. And this is how you build a neural network in C-sharp. So uh, if you look at that structure that we had previously right here, um, so here's the structure, see? Convolution pooling, convolution pooling, convolution pooling, convolution pooling. So we have four groups of convolution and pooling. Then we have a dropout layer, and then we have two dense layers. Now check the code. Convolution pooling, convolution pooling, uh, convolution pooling, convolution pooling. So that's the four convolution and pooling layers. Then a dropout layer, and then two dense layers. So you can see there's a one-to-one -one mapping of the uh, layers in the neural network and the methods that I, I am calling to create the neural network. So that's why I like my sandwich model. Um, once you know the layers that create the neural network, you can just create the whole thing line by line calling these methods. Um, so this is actually a little library that I wrote myself. I'm, I, I'm heavily inspired by Keras. Keras is a Python machine learning library, which is really cool. And you can just create neural networks with a couple of lines of code. That wasn't possible in CNTK. So I created my own library that, where you can just, with single lines of code, you can create these neural networks and stack them. So uh, pretty cool. So this is the entire neural network. I can see there's one more step at the top, multiply by, um, where I, um, I multiply every pixel by one divided by 255. So basically, I'm taking those pixel values from 0 to 255, and I renormalize them to a scale from 0 to 1, because I want to work with floating point numbers between 0 and 1. Why should everything be from 0 to 1? It's just one of those things in machine learning. Neural networks are a lot more stable if the data is between 0 and 1. Uh, researchers have discovered that over the years. So it's, it's become a convention. So this builds the neural network. So super simple. Um, then, uh, so we're going to prepare for training. <clears throat> so um, during training, I'm constantly measuring how good my neural network is. How good is it at recognizing cats and dogs? And I need to pick a formula, uh, a mathematical formula that measures the accuracy of the neural network. And there's, there's loads of formulas that you can pick. 
um, and they all have slightly different behaviors during training, but a very popular one is called cross entropy. So I'm basically, I'm picking that one here. So I've got a, it's called cross entropy with softmax and I'm using it to calculate the accuracy of my neural network during training. So basically what happens is um, the neural network gets trained on a, on a group of images and then um, the, uh, the, the code will use this formula, cross entropy with softmax, to calculate how good the answer is. So how good the neural network is at um, recognizing cats and dogs. And then it will try to make the output of this formula as small as possible. So in the perfect situation, cross entropy with softmax returns zero, which means that the output of the neural network perfectly matches the predictions that I gave up front. So um, it'll try to get that the output, the output of that thing to zero. So the second part that you need to provide is something called a learner. A learner is a specific algorithm that makes changes inside the neural network to make the uh, error as small as possible. There's many different ways in which you, we can fiddle with the internal configuration of a neural network during training. And a very popular algorithm is called Adam Learner, an Adam Learner. Um, if you want to find out what, what the thing is, just go to Wikipedia and uh, uh, Google for Adam Learner and you get uh, pages of mathematics on how that thing works. Um, here I'm just picking it because it's, it's an awesome default. Um, and those configuration parameters that you see are also good default parameters to work with. I always pick these numbers. Um, again, if you want to know why do I pick these numbers, go to Wikipedia and study the mathematics. Hey. Um, so I'm using an Adam learner to tweak the neural network during training. So um, next step is I need to create a trainer and an evaluator. That's just uh, C and TK classes for running the training and running the evaluation. There's not much intelligence in there. And then we start with the actual training. So um, training, uh, we train a neural network over and over and over. Um, and we, we train on a subset of the data. So uh, I'm not going to show all 2,000 images to the neural network up front because that's just going to slow it down too much. I will pick a batch. So um, a batch uh, is defined up here. Let me just look up the constant. Uh, here, see, batch size. It's set to 32. So that means I will train the neural network using groups of 32 images. Groups of 32 images. We call that a batch. So, uh, and those images, they're completely random. So basically the, the code just picks random, 32 random images from the data and then trains the neural network on that to get a, an error as low as possible. Um, and then we pick another batch of 32 image and then another batch and then another batch. So basically it's, it's a loop where we continuously train on batches of 32 images. So um, uh, this first loop does exactly that. So we're training. And one cycle of training, so we, we train on a batch of 32 images, and then we do a quick test how well the network is performing on a different batch of 32 images. We call that an epoch. So an epoch is one iteration during training. And usually what we do is we display the accuracy of the neural network at the end of a single epoch. So in this case, I will train for 100 epochs. So um, I will do that batch training 100 times. And during every step of the way, I will show the current accuracy of the neural network. So that's, that's going to happen in this loop. So the training, basically what it does is it sets up these batches. So it's, uh, that's the, these three lines here. So it sets up a batch of data to train and validate on. So this first line creates a batch uh, and it has both the training images and the validation images together. And then these next lines split them apart. So features batch is the images that I'm training on. And label batch um, is the, wait, 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 wait. I need to explain this correctly. This line creates a batch of the images to train on and the output labels. So the zeros and ones, you know, is it a cat, is it a dog? And it's, it's combined them together into one data structure. And then these lines split them apart. So features batch is a collection of 32 images to train on. And labels batch is a collection of 32 numbers that are either zero or one. And that describe if the corresponding image is a dog 
or accounts? Are you with me so far? Okay, so put in the chat. Are you with me so far? I'll quickly zoom back. So is it clear so far? Yes, Felipe says it's clear. Hector, yes, it's clear. So put in the chat if it's not clear. And uh, crystal clear, Eugene, awesome. I'm seeing an awesome question, by the way, from Brett Pearson. Brett asks, um, you said output probability is for dog and cat. Does the sum always equal one? I love that question, dude, that's, that's brilliant. Okay, so here's how it works. Yes, the sum is always one, but we have to specifically design that into the neural network. And we do that with, let me scroll back. We do that with this thing right here. So the layers at the end of the neural network, the um, dense layer, um, they have something called an activation function attached on top of that. So I won't explain what that is. Um, you'll have to see, uh, you have to check my course for that. Um, but for now, um, so accept the fact that you can have a specific activation function that's woven into the neurons of the, of the network layer. Um, the most popular activation function is ReLU. Basically, everybody uses this thing. It's called ReLU. It's a specific function. It does something. It changes the output of a neuron. But um, when we're working with probabilities, ReLU doesn't work. And for probabilities, we have a different function called softmax. And softmax has a beautiful side effect that it guarantees that all the outputs together add up to one. So if we use softmax, we always get mutually exclusive probabilities. So in this case, the neural network is going to say it's either a dog or a cat. Either a dog or a cat. What we can also do is change this thing because there are many probability functions and there, sorry, there are many activation functions. And there's another one called sigmoid. If I put sigmoid in there, then I still have probabilities on the output side of my neural network, but they no longer add up to one. Which means that now the neural network is saying, okay, you're showing me a picture and I am 80% confident that there's a cat in this picture, but I am also 45% confident that there is a dog in this picture. So now the probabilities are independent. So the neural network is basically, it's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for cats, 80% uh, sure I see a cat. Now I'm looking for dogs, I'm 45% sure I see a dog. So it's a different scenario. You can, you can use sigmoid uh, outputs um, if you want independent output probabilities. If you want dependent output probabilities, you use softmax. Whoops, let me just <laughs> undo that to get softmax back. Here we go. So this is how you tweak the, um, uh, the behavior of the output side of the neural network. Well, let's roll back. Here we go. So we were here. Let me quickly peek at the chat window. Yep, everything's still clear. Awesome. Okay, so now finally we're going to train the neural network and it's just this line of code. So you can see that I'm calling this, this method called train batch and it will train the neural network. You can see it uses this trainer class that I've set up previously. And the input is the, um, the features description. So remember, this is the description of the feature data. It's not the actual data, but it's like a description of what the data is. You know, it's, it's a floating point uh, data, and it, it's this structure of 150 by 150 by three channels, you know, that thing. And the actual batch, which contains the data. So you always provide those two things, the description of the information and the actual information. And I need to do that for the features and for the labels. So in this case here, the labels is just a descriptor that says it's a floating point number. And we want two numbers, one for dogs and one for cats. And this is the actual batch with the 32 numbers that are either zero or one. So again, a description and the actual data. So I just pass all that information into this train batch method. And then it returns a tuple. Um, it gives me back two values the loss of the, uh, of the neural network and the evaluation of the neural network. In this case, they're the same. And th so these numbers are the cross entropy loss. So it's a number that describes the accuracy of the neural network. And uh, we want that loss value to be as low as possible. Uh, ideally, we want it to be zero. And that's it. So in this loop over and over and over again, we're training the neural network. And um, the um, um, so this is for a single epoch. 
But after the training, we immediately validate the neural network. So we do this in the same epoch. So now you can see the code is the same, basically, but now I'm using the validation reader. So I get the, the images that I'm using for testing. So I, I create these batches again from the validation image reader, and now I call test batch. So test batch uh, again works on the features and the labels, so images and the, um, the output, is it a dog or a cat? And now the answer, the answer is something we call the accuracy. And the accuracy is a number between zero and one, and it describes how many mistakes the neural network is making. So an accuracy of zero means that the neural network is wrong every single time. And an accuracy of 100% or one basically means that the neural network is right every time with every single prediction. So during training, we want to see the accuracy go up to one. And that's it, that's the entire code. And here at the end, you can see that um, I'm saving the trained neural network into this file called model. But you, you can take this neural network and you can basically, tr uh, you can train the whole thing and then you just save it away and you, it gets serialized into this file. So this is just like a huge number of floating point numbers all compressed into a data file. And then in a different app, I can load the trained neural network and do cool stuff with it. So that's, that's the app. So I'm just gonna run it. It's a bit slower because I'm, I'm running Zoom uh, at the same time. So, so here you can see the architecture of the neural networks. So I'm getting like a description of all the layers that are in the network. And look at this number here. Total number of parameters, 3,453,634. Uh, so these are the number of tweakable parameters inside the neural network, almost three and a half million. So during training, the uh, training algorithm, the Adam learner is going to tweak those three and a half million numbers to try and optimize the neural network and make it as accurate as possible. Three and a half million parameters. So you, you can see the, this is the challenge with neural networks. They, they, uh, they have a huge number of parameters that we need to optimize during training. So training takes forever. And to train a neural network, we have to show it millions and millions of images. So uh, we've got millions of the images and we have millions of parameters and we cross them during training. So uh, this stuff, you really need a fast computer for this. Um, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's, I'm doing this on a MacBook Pro from 2015. That's kind of pushing it. I mean, it's working. You can see the code is working, but I, I am pushing it. Okay, so training a single epoch takes um, about 90 seconds on my MacBook. And it's gonna take slightly longer now because, the, um, because I'm running Zoom at the same time. So I'm just gonna quickly check in the chat if you guys have any questions. Um, the, okay, so Niels Martin, you have a question. Um, is the model a complete black box or would it be possible to see which features the network has detected? Um, yes and no. Neural networks are black boxes. I mean, it's basically um, three and a half million neurons connected together in crazy configurations. So it's really hard to, to figure out why the neural network is making a decision. But there is a trick um, that you can use um, where um, you show a picture to a neural network and then you look at all the layers and you measure the level of activation in those layers. And then you change the picture. You, you start changing random pixels. And then you look at the activation. And then you change random pixels and you look at the activation. And you keep tweaking the image, the input image, until a single layer has maximum activations. So all the neurons in that layer are active at their highest value. And then that image that you're holding apparently shows features that that specific layer has been trained to recognize. So then if you were to look at the image, you would probably see like a, a whole grid of cat ears, you know, like lots and lots and lots of cat ears in a certain configuration. And then you could conclude, hey, so this layer responds to the ear of a cat. Um, or you would look at the image and it's basically a fur pattern of a cat. So it's, it's like this calico pattern of a, of, a, of a kitty, you know, and you would say, okay, so this layer has been trained to recognize the fur. So th that's a trick that you can use to, um, to, 
see what kind of visual patterns a specific layer in the neural network activates on. So it has been trained to recognize. It works pretty well, but unfortunately you have to change random pixels in the input image to find that layer activation. So this whole testing is pretty slow as well. So you can have a fully trained neural network and then just finding out what it has actually been trained on can take hours or even days because you have to create these images. So these things are called activation maps. So if you wanna learn more about that, Google activation map. Okay, so let's go back. So you can see it's still working on Epoch 1. It hasn't even completed the first Epoch. It's still working on those 32 images. So that, that takes a while. Actually, it's not true. A single Epoch um, trains all images in the set. So I've got 2000 images in my data set and um, I've split them. I'm using half of the images for um, uh, testing, half of the images for training and half of the images for testing. I've got 2,000 cats and 2,000 dogs, so 4,000 images in total. Um, so I've got 2,000 for training and 2,000 for testing, right? Now, during each epoch, I train the neural network on all 2,000 images, but I train in batches of 32. So I train on 32 images, and then I pick the next batch of 32 images, and I train. And then I take the next batch of 32 images and I train. So basically it's a loop that just spins through the entire set of 2000 images in groups of 32. And that entire process, we call that a single epoch. And I've got 100 of those. So you can see training has finished for the first epoch and I have a training accuracy of 0 0.5. So it's not bad. Um, it means that I show images of dogs and cats to the neural network. And out of every 100 images, 50 are correct, 50 are bad. Um, so now it's doing validation. So it's going to show a different set of images to this trained neural network to see how accurate it is. So you can see validation takes some time as well. So a single epoch is pretty slow. So we can wait for that. While we're waiting, put in the chat, how good is an accuracy of 0 0.5? Imagine if I just use a random number generator. I have a picture of a dog or a cat and I just grab a random number and I say, it's a dog or it's a cat. Um, let's say I pick a random number between zero and one. And if it's more than 0 0.5, I say, it's a dog. What accuracy does the random number generator have? So Hector, you're saying 50%. So what's the accuracy value between zero and one? Anyone? What's the accuracy value? What's the accuracy value of pure random chance? It's super simple. So <laughs> I'm hoping this is a network glitch. It's 0 0.5. <clears throat> I mean, sorry, it's not a trick question. It's super simple, 0 0.5. Um, so pure random chance, um, if, you, if you just ignore the neural network, you don't even use the neural network, you just do, you know, uh, new random and then random put next and you grab a number and it's purely random, then you always get an accuracy of 0 0.5. So that's really, uh, um, really funny. Our neural network in the first epoch has an accuracy of 0 0.5. And this is exactly like you would expect because all the neurons have random values. So the, the neural network, it hasn't been trained yet. It's just a whole bunch of random values. So of course you get 0 0.5. So that's always where we start out with. Okay, so here we go. So training and validation is finished. So now validation accuracy is also 0 0.5. So again, this is exactly what we would expect. So this was one epoch. You can see this, is, is, I've got a warning about a corrupt, um, um, a corrupt JPEG file. So it's just a warning. I mean, the code will work. Uh, it's not a big deal, but um, it, um, um, it, it, it shows up in every epoch. So I've got one corrupt cat image somewhere in my data set and I haven't found it yet. Okay, so, so what do you think is gonna happen in the next epoch? So it's doing epoch number two. What kind of accuracy am I going to see? I mean, it's not gonna be an exact number. I mean, you have no idea what kind of number it's gonna be, but um, do you think, Will it be more than 0 0.5 or less than 0 0.5? So Brett, you're saying 0 
So that's definitely a possibility. So that's more than 0 0.5. So that is entirely true. The accuracy will go up. So the longer I train this neural network, the higher the accuracy will become. And hopefully by the end, I will have an accuracy of one, which means that the neural network is perfect. It can perfectly recognize every single dog and every single cat. Now, if you think about it, imagine if the neural network returns an accuracy of zero. Zero. Is this realistic? Do you think I can build a neural network that has an accuracy of zero? Think about that. Put your answer in the chat. What do you think? Is this realistic or not? I see you're, you're all thinking about it. So Hector, you're saying it's a neural network that is as blind as a bat. True? So the neural network is wrong every single time. Is that realistic? Redmi, you're saying not. Why not? Can you elaborate on that? If a neural network is wrong every single time, uh, does it know if the image is a dog or a cat? So uh, Kevin, you're saying it's not realistic. You have to have a bad network because chances to get it right are bigger than zero. Okay, so 0 0.00001. So a tiny number, just above zero. So Brett, you said, what happens if you feed in 100% random data, like static? Well, think about it. Eh? Imagine if a neural network is wrong every single time. That's pretty awesome, actually. So I show a picture of a dog and it says cat. I show a picture of a cat and it says dog. And it's wrong every single time. So the thing here is the network is actually correct every single time, but with the labels flipped. So it's really hard to be wrong every single time. The only way a neural network can be wrong every single time is if it knows exactly if it's looking at a dog or a cat and it just gives the opposite answer. So that's the cool thing about accuracies in neural networks. Um, the accuracy always starts at 0 0.5 and you're trying to get it to one. And if you see numbers below 0 0.5, that's, up, that's usually a sign that something weird is going on. If you drop below 0 0.5, it means that the neural network is actually learning the animals, but it's, it's, it's outputting the wrong labels. So it's, it's, it's learning to lie, basically, and it's, it's becoming a really good liar. The only way to be a perfect liar is to actually know the truth so that you can say the opposite. So keep that in mind. So here is epoch number two, and you can see the training accuracy is 0.53. 0 0.53. So this is pretty awesome. In a single epoch, we went from 50% to 53%. So the neural network has improved. And if you look at the uh, validation data, so we're pretty close to the point where the validation data will appear. Um, we can check what that is. So that's the other set of 2000 images. Where we will do a quick test. So let's wait for that. So you can see it's exactly as expected. Eh? The accuracy is going up. Here we go, 0 0.51. So it's pretty awesome. Um, the training accuracy is 53% and the validation accuracy is 51%. So it's actually less. So put in the chat, why do you think this is happening? Why is the training accuracy higher than the validation accuracy? So the neural network is 53% accurate on training data, fantastic. And on the test data, it's 51% accurate. Why is that? It's a difficult question, but maybe one of you will figure it out. I'll tell you the answer in a, in a minute. So Kevin, you're saying it's learning of its mistakes. Uh, you're in the right track, you're on the right track. It's learning from its mistakes, but which, which set is it using for that? I've got my training set and my validation set. Which data set is it using to learn? Kevin, what do you think? No idea, but well, the training set. I have a training set and a validation set. It's only learning from the training set. So this is a very interesting effect. I'm training my neural network on the training data, and then I'm testing it on my validation data. So the neural network will get really, really good at um, 
the training data, at identifying cats and dogs in the training data. Um, but the validation data, I'm, I'm not training it on that. I'm just, I'm, I'm taking my completely trained neural network in a single epoch, and then I'm showing it the validation data. I'm saying, okay, what about these other dogs and cats? What do you think? And I get a different number. So I'll show you what happens. Check this out. So this is uh, the entire run. I mean, this entire run takes um, about three hours to complete. So I won't do that here. Um, th this is after three hours, a complete training set. And you can see the training of the cats and dogs. So the, um, let me uh, read this correctly. The um, plus signs is the training accuracy and the circles is the validation accuracy. So what you're seeing here, if you are um, experienced with machine learning, this will be a very fam familiar site. This is called overfitting. So overfitting is um, it, it's a very, very common problem that we run into when we train neural networks. Overfitting is when the neural network gets really, really good at, the, at recognizing the training data. So my 2000 dog and cat images, it, it's awesome at identifying dogs and cats in that set of data. But then when I show it completely different pictures, the, um, the network struggles. The neural network really struggles. So it's, it has learned to recognize specific features that are only in the training data and they're not in the validation data. And this could be anything. This could be noise. This could be static in the background. Um, this could be crazy stuff like in my training images, all the cats are indoors, you know, they're inside. And in the validation data, I have cats that are outside. So the neural network is, has learned that if there's a wall in the background or a door, then it must be a cat. So I'm showing it validation data and there's a cat outside in the grass and there's no door visible, no wall. So the neural network is like, well, I don't see a wall and I don't see a door, so it's gotta be a dog. You know? So the neural network has picked up stuff that has nothing to do with the animals in question. So this is called overfitting. The neural network is, 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 has learned to recognize features that have nothing to do with dogs or cats but with, with random correlations in the data that have nothing to do with what we're trying to train on. So it's called overfitting and it looks exactly like this. So at the end of the training, if you see the um, validation accuracy flatline and you see the training accuracy creep closer and closer and closer to one, to the optimal value, when those lines start to move apart, that's called overfitting. Pretty awesome, right? So um, this is what we don't want during training. We don't want overfitting. So let me quickly abort this training because it's, it's going to take too long. Um, I don't think you want to stay on this webinar for three hours, right? So there's a simple trick that we can do um, to avoid overfitting. Um, the um, easiest thing to, 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 uh, to solve this is have more data. Usually we would train a neural network on 100,000 data records. 100,000. Okay. But here, I only have 2,000 uh, cat and dog images. So I don't have enough data. And you always get overfitting if the data set is too small. Um, you want to get closer to that 100,000. So there's a little trick that we can do. Um, it's called data augmentation. And it's a trick where we, we take a single cat image and we mess around with the image. We rotate the cat a bit or we translate the cat or we warp the cat image, you know? We do a trapezium warp like this or like this. So we do these tiny little image transformations. So we take a single image, single cat image, and we do, we add like a hundred uh, different transformations of that same image. So now we have that cat 101 times in our data set. So we're blowing up our data set. So instead of um, 2000 cat images, I would have 200,000 cat images. So it's called data augmentation, um, uh, artificially inserting new records in your data set by using image translations, rotations, translations, and uh, warping. Um, and if I do that, uh, my data set just explodes. It goes from 2,000 to uh, 200,000. And then if I do another training run of three hours, um, it looks like this. So here, this is what we want to see. This is a pretty awesome training set where you can see that the accuracy is slowly creeping upwards, but the training and the validation errors stay close together. 
the training and the validation accuracy. You can see that they, it's no longer two diverging lines. They're, they're sticking together and moving together. And you can see that the maximum is around uh, 0.85, so 85%. So after uh, 100 um, epochs, 100 epochs, this neural network is 85% accurate. And we will not get beyond 85%. It's not possible. And the reason for that is that this architecture, this neural network architecture, only gets you to 85%. If you want to get higher, you need to add more convolutional layers. And the, the top of the line object detectors, like the awesome object detectors that, are, that can detect cars and pedestrians and traffic signs and all kinds of cool stuff, with, with super high 98% accuracy, they usually have 20 convolutional layers or 18, you know, like lots and lots. Here I only have four. So um, the architecture of this neural network is too primitive to go beyond 85%. And I still need to train for three hours. Eh? So you can see that it takes forever to, uh, to train a huge neural network. But this is what we want to see. So, okay, so Brett, you're asking, this machine learning is an example of a classifier, not an identifier, right? Correct. So a classifier always has classes on the output. It's a dog, it's a cat, it's a giraffe, it's an elephant. We call those classes, and a neural network that predicts classes is called a classifier. Correct. You can also create an identifier, though. Eh? I mean, I could train this neural network on faces, and then I can say I've got different output classes called Mark, Niels, uh, Kevin, Hector, and so on. And then um, it would identify faces, but it's still a classifier. So, uh, Vasil, you're asking, once the neural network is trained, how can you save its state? Well, like this. This single line of code. So I simply say network.save, and it saves all the three and a half million um, parameters into a data file. Now, this data file is uh, 13 megabytes in size, 13 megabytes. So, I mean, it's three and a half million floating point numbers. So um, it's, it's fairly compact, actually. And it contains the, also the structure of the neural network. So this, this layer architecture, it's all in the file. So um, we can just fade that thing away. So I've done that. So I've got the trained neural network with data augmentation at the end of epoch 100. So that's, that's at the end of this, um, this, this training cycle. Okay, so Gabor, you're saying, could we add another animal to the training set, like 2000 elephants and train with the same network and reach that 85% accuracy? Um, yeah, you can, but then you would have to add one extra output class. So then you would have three output classes, dog, cat, elephant. But yeah, it would work. And you can add as many animals as you like. However, for every extra animal that you add, the accuracy will go down, obviously. Eh? I mean, the more different types of animals you want to detect, the com more complex your neural network needs to be. However, if the animals are similar in terms of visual features, then you can easily combine them. So if you do uh, dog, cat, rabbit, dog, cat, or rabbit, you would probably get a pretty good accuracy because the, um, the neural network layers that, um, that, that trigger on fur would also trigger on the rabbit, you know? So uh, the fur of a cat and the fur of a rabbit is kind of similar. So the neural network could reuse its, its learned knowledge. But if you have three animals that have nothing to do with, with each other, like um, spider, snake, uh, mouse, um, then the, the three animals are so different from each other that you would probably get, a, you, you would see a drop in accuracy. But experiment, you can experiment with that. The fun is experimentation. This object detector works on anything. Um, Rismayana, you're asking, with this model, is it possible to classify another object such as woman versus man, smile versus angry? Yes, oh yes, works on anything. Um, okay, now let me show you a test application that will take the trained neural network and um, load a random image and tell you if it's a dog or a cat. So let me go back to the code. So here I've got the, I need to uh, load, I need to show my solution browser. Now this project is the starter project right here. There we go. So I've got, an, I've got a very simple application. So here's the XAML. Um, it's the WPF application. And it's just a, a window 
uh, with a big uh, canvas, so I can load images into that. There's a button floating on top of the canvas that will load a random image. And then at the bottom, I've got a text field and I can show it's a dog or it's a cat. So it's super simple, eh? just a, an image and then a label underneath. Um, then here's the code. So this is a lot of user interface plumbing code. But here's the, here's the cool stuff. So here's the code that will load the trained neural network and make a prediction. So check it out. Here I load the neural network. So it, it's super simple. Eh? I just need the file and I need here function.load and it will, it will load the neural network into memory. Bam, that's it. I've got everything. The neural network, the layers, the architecture, it's all there. So uh, super simple. Then the next step is I need to load the image and um, offer it to the neural network, basically. For that, I use a uh, package called OpenCV. OpenCV is like this, this image manipulation library, and you can do almost anything with it. So I've got this here, cv.cv2, that's like a typical OpenCV. So I'm using the image read method to read an image into memory. So it, it loads it into this thing uh, called a MAT, which is a, a matrix. So it's like a two-dimensional structure of uh, numbers. And then you can see here, I'm resizing the image to 150 by 150, so that I offer the image to the neural network in the correct size. I have to do this, eh? because at the input side of the neural network, I have one neuron per pixel. So I have to provide the correct number of pixels. So I resize the image to 150 by 150. And then I'm calling this method here, flatten by channel. And basically what it does is it creates a one dimensional array of floating point numbers. And it creates this, this huge array, which has the color channels um, after each other. So it, it's first, it does the entire image uh, in the red color channel, then the entire image in the blue color channel, and then the entire image in the green channel. It's a specific format that the neural network has been trained on. So this is how I provide the image to the neural network. So it's just a long string of numbers and it's pixel data. Um, so then I set up this, this thing called an ND array view. This is the data class, the type of data array that CNTK works with. It's called an ND array. So I create this ND array and I load the image data into there, into it. And then I set up these, these two dictionaries uh, to evaluate the image. So I need an input dictionary which contains the input data description. Now remember, this, is, this describes what the input data looks like. 150 by 150 by three. And this is the actual data, the pixel values. And on the output side, I provide the uh, description of what the output is supposed to look like, two floating point numbers. And I don't provide any data because I want the neural network to give me that data. So I put a null here. And then after I've run the neural network, this null value will be replaced with the two numbers I'm interested in. So then I, I run my neural network. I call evaluate on my neural network. And then here I grab the output. So basically I've got this, this method here called get dense data, which will um, grab the values on the output side of the neural network and um, it will return them in an array. And then here I can, I can grab the two numbers. So um, the, the element at zero, zero is the, um, I think it's the cat probability. And at zero, one, it's the dog probability. So that gives me the two probabilities. <coughs> and then um, once I have the numbers, let's see if I can find the code. Um, I've got some very simple code. I think it's, it's uh, where is it? It's so simple that I can't find it. Um, detect scenes, probably up here. Yeah, here we go. See, so I, I call detect scene. So that gives me the two numbers, cat probability and dog probability. And then I just build a string here. Um, if cat probability is greater than dog probability, I say it's a cat. Otherwise I say it's a dog. And then I put the probabilities after it. So I say cat confidence, percentage, dog confidence, percentage. That's it. So are you with me so far? Everybody understand how this app works? Code clear? Put it in the chat. Everything clear so far? Amoy says yes. Remy, yes. Eugene, yes. Niels, are you still with us? <laughs> clear so far? Kevin, yes. Hiroshi, yes. Nice. Awesome. So it's super simple. Eh? I mean, just a simple WPF application. 
Okay, Luisa, good. German, yes. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to run it. Check this out. But this is going to be really cool because you can see how well the neural network recognizes dogs and cats in practice. Exciting, wait for it. Here we go. Okay, so here's a random image from the data set. And you can see it's a cat and um, the app identified a cat. Yay, it's working. So the, the confidence that this is a cat is 83% and the dog confidence is 17. So 83 versus 17, you see they add up to 100. Um, so the app is pretty confident that this is a cat. So let's grab another one. So here's a dog, see 100% dog. So, you know, the, the app is like, this is definitely a dog, it's not a cat. So here, the first mistake. So it's a dog, but the app thinks it's a cat. Now look at the probabilities. 51% cat, 49% dog. So these are really close together. So basically the neural network doesn't really know what it's looking at. And it's slightly more confident that this is a cat. Um, no idea why. You can see that there's a flash reflection in the eye of the dog. So maybe it picked up on that. Um, maybe it saw the color of the dog and it's, it's, it looks like a color that cats typically wear. Um, but it, it's definitely triggering on something. So next one. So here a dog, 100% dog. So here another mistake. So this is a cat. Uh, the app thinks it's a dog. 66% uh, dog confidence, 34% cat confidence. So again, you can see it's, the app is not entirely sure what it's looking at um, and it made a mistake. Um, again, you, we don't know why the neural network thinks that this is a dog. It could be the pose. Eh? If you look at the way that the cat is standing, you know, this, this almost alert pose, maybe the neural network has learned that cats are often relaxed, you know, and they just lie flat on the floor. And a dog is often standing alert, you know, like uh, when you take a picture, a dog is like, hey, what's going on? And a cat is just ignoring you and sleeping. So maybe it has learned that an alert pose is probably a dog. We don't know. So next one. Okay, so this happens sometimes. There's an image um, somewhere in my data set that it's not a JPEG. I think I've got a PNG image somewhere in the data set and I, um, I'm not checking the extension. So I'm simply loading, I'm assuming it's a JPEG. So I'm passing a null value into the neural network and it crashes. So depending on the random number generator, the app just crashes sometimes. So pretend you didn't see that. I'll load it again. So I could have fixed it, but I discovered the, the bug this morning and I thought, you know, I'm just gonna uh, restart the app if it happens during the webinar, which it did. So let's continue. So um, accuracy is 85% on this neural network. So you wouldn't think that because you see a lot of mistakes, um, but uh, it's really 85% accurate over the entire data set. So here again, a mistake. You can see 100% dog confidence. We have no idea why. Now, in all fairness, the cat isn't fully visible here. Eh? I mean, the cat is, is mostly obscured. We only see the head. Um, so the neural network, maybe it, it focuses too much on legs. So <laughs> another mistake, 75% dog. That's a cat, correct? It's a dog, correct? It's, a, it's a, two cats and it thinks it's a dog. 100% dog confidence. Oops. Dog is correct. Dog is correct. Dog is correct. Dog is correct. Cat is correct. Cat is correct. Dog is correct. Dog is correct. Dog is correct. Dog is correct. Cat is correct. Dog is correct. Cat is correct. And then again, a mistake. So you can see I had a huge number of correct predictions. So um, it was just a coincidence that we had all the mistakes the first time I ran the app. Uh, over the whole, you'll get 85% accuracy. So here again, 98% confidence that this is a dog. So uh, again, you know, it's, um, with this specific neural network architecture, there's only so much we can do. Um, you won't get past 85% and you'll see these mistakes. Um, if I take a different neural network, I take a neural network with 16 convolutional layers or 19, then I can get all the way up to 99% accuracy. So the neural network will only make one mistake out of 100. 
And uh, this is typical, it's, it's competition that, that happens all the time. Eh? Like there are uh, challenges, AI challenges, where you have this huge data sets and you have to create code that performs the best on the data set. So this is typical of an AI challenge where you try to get as, as good as possible. So what do you guys think? How cool is this? So a question from Amol, if we increase the epoch, will the accuracy increase? Yes, but look at this graph that you're looking at right now. You can see that the accuracy is flatlining. So we can, we can train for 200 epochs that will double our training time, but you can see that the increase in accuracy is almost zero. So the line is almost flat. So we would probably go from 85% to 87, 89. So you're gonna have to wonder if, if, if it's worthwhile. If, it's, um, if you want to train for twice the amount of time, for six hours, only to get like three or 4% extra accuracy. Brett, we need a larger data set, not more epochs. Um, is that correct? Well, you need as many epochs as you, as you need to create a leveling off of the accuracy. So this graph, this is what you wanna see. You wanna see a huge improvement and then a leveling off and then you stop. As soon as your uh, accuracy during training starts to level off, you can stop, that's plenty of epochs. So you can see here, I could have stopped at epoch 40, 30 or 40. I would have a slightly worse accuracy, but uh, it would have hugely sped up my training time. Increasing the data set will, will definitely increase the accuracy. So the more data, the merrier. The more images of cats and dogs I have, the better I train my neural network to recognize the specificness of a dog or a cat. Brett, if we want to increase the accuracy to 90, you'll need more convolutional layers. Yes, so this specific neural network architecture is limited to uh, the maximum accuracy that you can achieve, and the maximum is around 85. Um, we've, we've increased the data set using augmentation, and the only thing that did was destroy, the, it, it removed the overfitting, but it didn't carry the accuracy far beyond 85. So I think with a bigger data set, you might get to 86 or 87, but that's it. So you'll need more layers to really get to 90 and to get to 99. Uh, human accuracy is about 95%, 95. So if you want to beat that, then um, uh, if you get to 99, then you have superhuman performance. You have an app that is better at recognizing cats than a human. So Brett, you're saying more epochs won't help? Correct. So you'll need a different neural network architecture. So what do you guys think? How cool is this? A cat and dog detector with 85% accuracy, 100% C-sharp. No Python code anywhere. Awesome, right? So Hector says, very cool, exactly. Remy, very cool, amazing. Niels Martin, thank you, Niels. <laughs> I was waiting for your, for your comments. Uh, so, fortunately, you haven't fallen asleep yet. Awesome, amazing, yes. Okay, so... Um, I've been talking for uh, 90 minutes. Thank you for bearing with me. See, I, I didn't manage to do it within an hour. Again, I always have that. Um, so Ruben, you say, I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you. I like that. Um, I'm going to show you the, the present at the end of the webinar um, so that you can, um, uh, if you want, you can sign off. Um, so my present, let me do that first before we get to questions. Um, I have a course that will teach you the basics of TensorFlow. So I, I specialize in C-sharp uh, machine learning, but I actually have a course that teaches you the basics of machine learning with Python and TensorFlow. So it's, it's like a quick introduction. It will teach you regression, uh, supervised learning, and it ends with a neural network. So a tiny neural network to uh, do handwriting recognition. And it's all in Python. So it's pretty cool because most of the machine learning jobs nowadays are in Python. So it's kind of useful if you are able to program in Python. Um, I will give you free access to that course. So I think it's $50 if you pay for it, but I'll give you a coupon code, a coupon code that will give you free access. So let me quickly um, search for the link that we're gonna need for that. So here's the coupon code. So it's called dogs and cats 1302 dogs and cats 1302 so if you enter that code you'll get the course for free and the url is here so i'm going to copy that into the chat here you go so if you look at the zoom chat um, click that link and you will get the course for free 
So that's my presence to you. Um, if you would like to get up to speed with machine learning using Python and TensorFlow, click that link, um, enroll in the course for free, and um, you'll learn everything leading up to neural networks. So pretty cool, right? So that was my gift to you, basically, uh, a free course to enjoy. Um, actually, Niels Martin, who's in this call, uh, who's watching the webinar, um, I have this thing with Niels that every time when I make a course, I give him access for free. And then in return, he writes me a nice review. Um, so basically, now what I'm doing is um, the free course that Niels would always get, you all get it. Everybody gets a course. You know? I'm like Oprah Winfrey, everybody gets a course. So lots of thank yous in the chat. You're welcome, guys. You're welcome. Um, I'll show you another uh, link. If you're watching the Facebook Live, um, my phone just died, <laughs> the battery died. So after this webinar, I'll add the link to the Facebook Live. So you can, you can use it there too. The coupon code will expire tonight. So you only have today to use it. So don't wait too long with this. Um, if you're interested in the full-blown course, which is right here, let me just uh, copy the link. So look at the chat window again. Here's another link. This is my uh, full-blown course. So it's a uh, machine learning course in C-sharp, six-week machine learning course. Um, what I've just shown you is a single day in this course. So I'm not kidding. Eh? Everything I've showed you is one day in the course and uh, one assignment. And I have assignments like this every single day, and there are 30 assignments like this. So you'll get this webinar and you get 29 other um, training sessions like this webinar we just did uh, over the time period of six weeks. So it's, it's just crazy. It's, uh, I've written all the code for you except the machine, machine learning parts. So you can actually keep up uh, doing all that stuff. Um, and um, it's a crash course. If you want a crash course in machine learning, like uh, you want to be uh, fully up to speed in machine learning in uh, two months time, so six weeks time, you do this course and you've got it at the end. You know, you, you can literally apply for a machine learning job and you'll be able to answer the questions people throw at you. Um, so it's, it's designed for C Sharp and .NET developers who want to really get up to speed with machine learning super, super fast. So I actually, I've got, um, I know a guy who works for a computer vision company and um, I think he's, he's using this course to get his employees up to speed in computer vision. There's actually a module on computer vision in there as well. So we'll do face tracking, uh, head angle detection in real time. We'll do emotion detection. It's like, you know, are you smiling? Are you looking sad? We'll do that on a live camera, in a live camera feed. Motion detection. So that's just the computer vision module. And we've got seven different modules. So it's, the course is crazy. I've, I've packed it with an insane amount of assignments and knowledge and, and material. So that explains why it's a bit, ex a bit expensive. I mean, you can see the prices here. Um, there's two flavors. Um, you, if you do the cheap flavor, the Rockstar option, um, you get all the course material, you'll get support on Facebook, but that's it. So yeah, you've got the course material, you've got all the assignments, and you've got um, semi-live support in a Facebook group. So you can interact with all the other students and uh, you can ask me questions. You can upload your homework in Facebook and I will grade you in Facebook. So everything goes through a Facebook group. If you take the expensive option, the rock star, uh, the superstar, sorry, then there's a live component in there as well. Then there are three calls every week, live video calls, where I'll go through the curriculum in real time. I'll address questions, I'll give uh, specific homework assignments. So there's like three hours of video every week and there is hands-on coaching. So I will call you directly and we'll talk for an hour. I'll help you get through the assignments and I'll help you get a job. So if you're, if you're launching a startup or you're looking to, to get a promotion in the field of machine learning, I'll coach you one-on-one -on -one and I'll make sure you get a job, you'll get a promotion. So my goal basically is that you can double your income or increase your income within six months after finishing the course. And I'll coach you one-on-one -on -one to make that happen. So it's, it's a more expensive uh, uh, tract, but um, it will make you richer. So, you know, there's that. And um, the third option is the superstar thing, and you can pay over three months. So you pay like 600 per month over three months, and then you have the superstar option with all the extras. Um, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm still tweaking with the extras. Um, I'm thinking of adding a graduation project where you, you can build your own machine learning project, and then you submit it, 
at the end of the course and then I'll pick the winner and I'll pay you a prize, you know, you'll get a, a couple of hundred dollars or say $500 prize money if you have the best design. Uh, so I, I might add a graduation project in there as well. So keep your eye on this, this page, it'll change. If you decide this is so awesome, you want to buy the course now, you can do that. Um, if I change it later and I add extras, of course, you'll get those extras too. You know, I'll just roll them into you as well. Um, so if you're interested, go check it out. Um, I've got a question here. Is this somehow applicable to audio, to sense emotions? Uh, no, we only look at the face. So we only look at uh, how faces move, how faces change um, to detect emotions. So like a smile, you know, the corners of your mouth go up, your eyes, your eyebrows go up, you know, the corner of your eyes go down. All these things, we can track them in real time and we can map those to emotions. So pretty cool. Uh, it's live. Huh? So you, you can, you can uh, create an app that switches on the camera and it does live emotion detection. So you can use that, I think, for if you give a presentation, you know, point a camera at the audience and you just count the number of people that are smiling. You can do crazy stuff like that. So Q&A, any questions? Um, question, how about C-sharp and MGU-CV? Um, I've heard about MGU-CV, but I have no experience with it. So I've heard people using it uh, who are happy, but I haven't used it. So I, I don't know how, how good it is. So unfortunately, I can't, I can't give you any, any good answer on that. But I've heard good stuff about it. So you can definitely use it. So I decided to use CNTK because it's official Microsoft. It's a Microsoft endorsed library. Any other questions? What do you guys think? Um, Philippe, do you have a self-paced course? I can't do it live. Everything is recorded. So if you go for the superstar option and you miss the live Q&As, I'll record them and I'll put the links in the course. So um, you can just watch them later. So that's no problem at all. And the coaching calls uh, will do them when you are able. So um, uh, we, can, we can work around any planning issues there as well. And the Facebook live is also, sorry, the Facebook group is also like non-live, right? So you upload your homework and then I see it a couple of hours later and I'll give you feedback and then you see it when you have time. So the only live component is the video calls, the three one hour video calls during the week. And you can just watch the recordings afterwards. And Rishmaya, what library did you use in this project? So for the neural network, I used CNTK. And for the image manipulation, I used OpenCV Sharp, OpenCV Sharp 3. Uh, those are the two important libraries. So the, the CNTK library is called uh, CNTK-GPU. So that's the uh, CNTK library that will use the GPU if you have one. My MacBook Pro does not have a GPU. So what you've seen is CPU performance, CPU only. Um, so Rishmania, the MGU-CV is a wrapper of OpenCV. Ah, okay, 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 sorry. I didn't get that. I thought it was a, a machine learning library. Um, yeah, so um, I use OpenCV Sharp 3. OpenCV Sharp 3. There's a ton of OpenCV libraries. And I, I noticed that OpenCV Sharp 3 is, it works really well. And it has um, 200,000 downloads. It's more popular than the official OpenCV wrapper. So I use this one instead. All right, what else? Any more questions? So if you ask questions on Facebook Live, unfortunately, I can't see them because I lost my, uh, my uh, connection. Um, so uh, sorry about that. So Rishmaya, you say, great, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other stuff you would like to hear? You know, it's, it's been 90 minutes, so it's fairly long. You must be exhausted. <laughs> if you're in the Europe, European time zone, you're probably starving and wanting to eat something. Uh, Resmi, give me a thumbs up emoji. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give you two thumbs up back. Gabor, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Gabor, for watching live. Philippe, thanks, Mark. Thank you, Philippe. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. So Remy, thank you, most helpful. So if you want the source code that I showed you, it's in the course. So it's in both Rockstar and Superstar. 
Um, usually, so usually I give out free source code at the end of the webinar, but this, this part is, it's kind of like a key part of the course. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping that in the course for now. Um, but if you want full access to this code, then if you sign up for the course, um, you'll, you'll get it. You'll have literally the code I just, uh, I just showed you, and it will be an assignment. It will be one of the assignments in the course where you will have to build an object detector and use it to recognize dogs and cats. So that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, so Hector, um, you're in this call, Hector Sosa, you've done the course already with me in November. Um, so when you did the course, the, the test application wasn't in there yet, the app to test the trained neural network. So if you um, refresh the, uh, the source code, if you uh, refresh the code of the course, then you'll see that extra uh, project show up. So I've, I've added it to the source code of the course. So you can access it too, if you like. I mean, you've bought the course already, so obviously you get the, you get the source code. And for everyone else, if you want it, join the course, because it's awesome. It's the best C-sharp machine learning course out there. Actually, it's the only C-sharp machine learning course out there. There's no other course that teaches you machine learning and deep learning in C-sharp with C and TK. There's no other course, I'm the first one. So, Hector, awesome source. Yeah, I, I remember you said that before. Eh? That's your, uh, <laughs> your, your, your key uh, uh, comment. Awesome source, yes, thank you. All right, so thank you everyone. Last chance to ask me a question and then I'll, I'll wrap this up. This Maya, I'm leaving the room because in one, at 1 a.m. in my country um, and then something in Indonesian. <laughs> thank you very much in Indonesian. Okay, thank you, Riz Maya. Thank you for watching. Okay, guys, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you for watching. Thank you for bearing with me for so long. Um, um, enjoy the free Python TensorFlow course. Have fun getting up to speed with machine learning. And if you'd like to, to take this a step further, um, check out my big course, my big C Sharp course. And I hope to see you in the course and we can have some fun together for the next six weeks. It starts on the 3rd of March. So that's in, I think, 19 days from now. Well, that's, uh, slightly over two weeks. So um, the first week of March is when the course starts. So um, check it out and I hope to see you in there. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for watching the webinar and see you next time.